I kind of liken my life to to having a fire a fire truck being the lord over this village and having one fire truck and seeing multiple fires pop up in any time throughout the course of the day and you only have one fire truck yeah and so it's a question of which which places burn and which don't yeah how do you choose where to spend your time uh for you that must be fascinating you yeah. must have 10 things you can be at right now. I try to carefully prioritize um, as much as I can, but at times it's a lot of it is just trying to, to pack as much as possible into every day. And sometimes that means it's a 20 hour day in order to be able to accomplish everything and touch, touch all of the various uh, ventures, enterprises, projects that I have responsibility Mm -hmm. over. And, uh, and then some days you have a little bit of reprieve and you, you're not running quite a sprint, but today is pretty typical. I, I've probably put, oh, already I've put 200 miles on my car today. Oh my gosh. So no exaggeration. I probably put 200 miles on my car. I've crisscrossed the valleys multiple times, darting from meeting to meeting. I just came from the University of Utah Research Park <laughs> down here. And then I've got my next meetings in Cottonwood. Oh my gosh. And so um, it's. You're living on I 15, man. Yeah, I live on I 15. I, I only wish we had flying cars <laughs> yeah, right now exactly. to be able to make it back and forth because it would be much more. Well, efficient. sometimes you take a helicopter, don't you? Uh huh. Yeah. One, once in a while, we'll do um, helicopter site tours with clients and to be able to see projects within a, a, a very compact uh, period of time and, and to see it dynamically, to see yeah. the market. But. How did you build yeah. the real estate business? How did you oh. get into it? Well, um, so are we in? You know, are we yeah, on? by the way, we've been going ever since I walked in here. Oh, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, uh, I'm glad I didn't use any profanity. Well, maybe I did. I've, I've got to work on that. Um, you know, I started at 18. I, it's my oft-told uh, origin story. You know, when I was 13, I read the book Iacocca by the great automotive icon, Lee, mm -hmm. Iacocca, Lee Iacocca, who we can we can thank for the Ford Mustang and we can curse for the Chrysler minivan. Yeah, um, as he was the father of both um, both of those those uh, great platforms. That's kind of fascinating, huh? To like two completely different vehicles. Oh yeah, and and his experience at, at both Ford and Chrysler were very different. And to read his experience at age thirteen in Pleasant Grove in junior high, yeah, awakened in me this curiosity for, for not only business and life and the way the world operates, but I, I wanted to know who, who controls the world. I mean, who are the, yeah. who are the entrepreneurs, the, the policymakers, the captains of industry that are changing the landscape of our economy, our world as we know it. And you know, by the time I was a senior in high school, uh, getting toward the end of my senior year, I didn't want to just simply go to school like my friends. I, sure. I wanted to, yeah, I had a scholarship to what is now Utah Valley University, mm -hmm. but I, I wanted to stack my courses to be early morning as much as possible to free me up for the rest of the day so I could focus on my career, yeah. on a career path in business. And as I looked at all of the, the various career paths that would hopefully give me an opportunity to work with the captains of industry, the people that I was reading about as I had my own subscriptions, the Wall Street Journal and mm -hmm. Business Week in high school. You I, had that in high school? Yeah. So from when I was a junior and senior that in high school. That is nerdy, I, dude. Yeah. I had, well. <laughs> but I had long hair and I had rock bands. Oh, so I think I was a bit uh, of a mystery to a lot of people. I'd wear a suit once a week just to screw with people, um, just <laughs> Just to keep people. Is it guessing. true you don't own, own a pair of jeans? It is true. You don't I, own one pair. Yeah, the the last pair of jeans that I owned was a pair of Jerbo jeans in 1991, <laughs> um, my senior year in high school. Uh, I haven't had any since, and I I have I do have some tennis shoes. So I used to say okay. that I didn't own a, a pair of jeans or tennis shoes, but I do have a nice pair of Porsche design uh, nice. tennis shoes, <laughs> nice. and I think some Ferrari tennis shoes, just because they look stylish, yeah. and I was able to pick them up. But it it was funny. Ending my my high school with really this research project of trying to identify a career path, especially born out of my fascination for 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 really 
the economy and who, right. who is who is who is driving business um, led me to commercial real estate. Commercial real estate was the only career path that would afford me that opportunity, allow me to be licensed at eighteen, and if mm. if given the right platform and the right mentors, you know, help me position to to hopefully have an impact yeah. on on our communities. Uh, anyone in business has to have a real estate strategy at one point or another. Yeah, for sure. And to be a trusted advisor to to help guide entrepreneurs and CEOs, uh, even developers down the path of of planning their their long-term real estate or facilities planning strategy or even their investment strategy if they're using real estate as part of their diversification. Mhm. Uh, was a was a great opportunity, and so I I spent my first year building a proprietary database, cataloging every building from downtown Provo to to downtown Salt Lake. Wow! Along the entire Wasatch Front. What did you build that in Excel? Uh, it was a it was a program. I got the beta oh, version really? of a program called Action Plus, which was an early contact management database program. Okay. And uh, and it it was customized to to work within commercial real estate and allow me to plug in all of the data uh, for the fields that would be relevant to commercial real estate. So every building that I would catalog and go through, I, I'd go to the top floor and I'd work my way all the way down to the to the first floor and I would I would take careful notes and I'd try to weasel my way past the gatekeepers, mm-hmm. past the the admin or the you know, the front desk sure. to get into the the key decision makers, into the CEOs or the managers in order to profile their company and get a get a sense for not only how much square footage they occupied but also what did they anticipate in the future when does their lease expire do they see themselves growing in the future you know, and and really cataloging that as as a young business student yeah. and also a commercial real estate professional and i never really saw myself as a as a realtor or a commission salesperson i saw myself as a trusted advisor, hopefully to to these yeah. these executives and these entrepreneurs to help them identify the best opportunities to to take advantage of on their trajectory, on yeah. their growth trajectory, whatever that may be. And so, within a year, I built this really comprehensive database. Probably which, worth a lot. That uh, database, you know, at the time. it was it was invaluable because it it gave me a crystal ball. Uh, equivalent yeah. uh, view of the market. I could, to some degree, predict who was most likely to be evaluating their their real estate requirements, and I had various prompts that would that would trigger me calling them back, following up, and so I, I built a book of business, a lot of lead generation that first year, and then ended up going on a on an LDS mission and taking a two year break. But I kept my my license active. And when I went into the MTC, it was funny. I had my parents pull over the side of the street to take a picture of me in front of mm-hmm. what was the Beneficial Life Building in Provo, which is 2696 North University Avenue. It's a red brick and, and glass building right. right across from the Riverside Country mm-hmm. Club. Yeah. I had my name in front of that building when I was 18 years old, leasing space. <laughs> so I wanted to at least have some type of record. So I had them stop quickly. And then uh, jumped right into the mission field, uh, and I uh, I quickly obtained a brick phone when I arrived in Hawaii in order to discreetly keep in touch with my office periodically back here in Salt Lake City <laughs> to see that my deals That's so cool. that my that my partners were following through and that the transactions mm-hmm. that I had under contract at the time were were moving through due diligence and moving to completion. And so my first office park sale occurred when I was 19 in my greeny area on the west side of Oahu in Hawaii. You went to Hawaii on your Yeah, someone's got to do it. Someone That's has to. That's a hard it's calling. Tough duty. Um, <laughs> so it was funny. Here I am on a bike on the west side of Oahu and uh, finally get word that a deal that I had sourced from from inception all the way through to closing on a on a complex right across from St. Mark's Hospital on 39th South and 11th East in in Salt Lake City mm-hmm. had finally closed and it took it took about i'd say it was close to a year and a half which is not 
unusual. In fact, the sales cycle associated with commercial real estate is is typically quite long, Mm -hmm. requires a lot of patience, persistence. That's why very few people survive commercial real estate. Just because it's- It's a tough career. It's It's a tough path because the sales cycle is long, the vernacular, the process- that you employ is, you know, in the commercial real estate business is so dynamic and each transaction takes on a, a, a different life, a yeah. different form. And, um, and it, there is a learning curve associated with that. And there's a high degree of risk because for every 10, 20 transactions or potential deals you may be working on, maybe one or two come to fruition and yeah. actually close. And those don't close for months, sometimes years down the Mm. road. And so I was very fortunate to have a number of deals close while I was on my mission uh, that I had sourced during that starvation first year where I made nothing. Yeah. I made $500 in a year working (laughs) full time while carrying a full load of college courses. And it was an incredible opportunity for me to see business in action. I bought my first Armani suit on my mission, uh, Kahala Mall. That's so cool. <laughs> well, I had my brick phone, and uh, and it really set the stage. So when I got home, literally the day after I got home, I launched right back into my career, and didn't miss a beat. So did you start your own agency? Did you? I mean, I don't really no, know how I act, real act, estate works. Yeah, actually worked honestly. for a couple of boutiques, small yeah. boutique firm, and then I graduated um, to a company called Wallace Associates, who became Grubb and Ellis, who was at that time the second largest commercial real estate firm in the world, had a major presence downtown Salt Lake City. In fact, multiple floors right above Lamb's Cafe at 165 South Main. And up until the time I was 25, I I really built momentum. By the time I was 25, I think I had had dominant market share of the office market uh, between Salt Lake and Utah County. Uh, more listings than anyone, and was was fortunate to be representing a lot of growth companies, especially technology yeah. oriented. Uh, before there was the Silicon Slopes. Yeah. I mean, I was representing a lot of Norda Family Trust. Oh yeah, companies yeah, yeah. or what we would call Canopy Group companies Maybe, back in the day. Were you involved at the Ashtons too up there? Thanks, um, Point. Um, early on, not so much. Later, yeah. I got involved with uh, with leading the capital campaign for mm. the the. The Museum of Natural Curiosity, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. but but back in the '90s, I was representing a number of companies um, that you may I don't know if you've heard of these Vinca Corporation, Helios, Caldera Systems, you, Calderas. I know Helios. Um, I didn't know the first one. He said, um, "What was the first one?" Vinca. Vinca was sold one. to Legato Systems uh, in a major deal. Uh, in fact, uh, we ended up putting their headquarters up at the Old Ward Perfect Campus in about 40,000 square feet as the new parent company that had acquired Vinca uh, was was preparing to shift a lot of their operational expansion to Utah. That didn't end up coming coming to fruition, but so many of the other companies that were yeah. that were funded by Ray Norda. Yeah, Norda's a legend. And, uh, and the Norda family you know, ended up you know, propelling our community to another level. I mean, Altiris. Altiris is um, legendary. Ended up being sold Obviously to Cemento. Novell. Oh, yeah. And I I had this privileged position of being able to, to advise these early stage companies when they were going from just a scrappy startup to, to employing hundreds, if not thousands, yeah, and that must have been fascinating. It watch. was a it, it was an incredible privilege and continues to be a privilege to this day. I've I I think I I have the most fun representing companies, growing companies yeah. and helping them chart the course for the future and to be able to not only procure the right concessions and economic package associated with their facilities planning, but to really look at all of the the qualitative factors. Yeah, it's not just about the quantitative. You know, when it comes down to lease rates and and economic concessions and operating expenses, it, it also drives to you know signage, identity, mm-hmm. parking, amenities. Um, you know, all of those those things that actually help companies both recruit and retain key talent in today's right crazy world. I mean, we live in such a dynamic time. Who's been the most surprising client where you're like, wow? They uh, took off. You know, originally it was Ancestry. Yeah. I uh, started working with them in 90, 1998, 99. Um, they were just in a little space behind the Orem Post Office. 
in really? the old Word Perfect Publishing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. space and uh, started working with with them when they, they were just a handful of employees, and they uh, they were publishing a periodical for genealogists all over the world. In fact, I think at the time it was well over ninety percent, maybe ninety five percent of their customer base was not. Latter-day Saint was not what you would think mm-hmm. um, when thinking of a company focusing on genealogy in Orem, Utah. Um, and I was I was very fortunate to, to engage with them as their broker at that early stage at a time when they were establishing this website, this portal, this myfamily.com yeah. uh, web presence. And in a very short, accelerated period of time, we went from just a couple of thousand square feet to staging their growth to ultimately take the the f- former Franklin Covey campus in yeah. the Riverwoods, which is 120,000 square feet. So, so imagine working with a company that's just in a little scrappy Class C office space behind the Orem Post Office and being able to guide the process associated with expansion and and identifying the the optimal path to grow to what ended up being 120,000 square feet in Provo to now 200,000 square feet. I was fortunate years later to not only sell the former Ancestry.com campus to now it's UCCU, who oh, yeah. has it as their headquarters, but also had uh, the good fortune to structure the build to suit the 200,000 square foot build to suit in Lehigh at Traverse Mountain with Ancestry. That and, campus... That oh, building is unbelievable. Well, to see the evolution yeah. is quite gratifying. And I can give you probably 50 to 100 examples that are just as exciting yeah. and dynamic. I mean, I remember when Josh, James, and John Pistana, <laughs> uh, when they had mycomputer.com. Yeah. I, I knew them. Not Why a, did we always do that back then? Myfamily.com, mycomputer.com. Yeah, it was my computer. I think my they got the website. was the beginning of everything. Yeah. yeah. They were on Geneva Road at the time. Yep. Uh, again, scrappy. They were small, you know working on their growth strategy and innovating and uh, and to see them really take it to the next level and fr- frankly um, succeed in spite of the challenges associated with fundraising and the naysayers oh, and to yeah. see Omniture become not only a major force in presence but probably one of the high, most high profile M&A deals in Utah history for sure it put us on the map i mean we're talking like 2009 it was $1.8 billion. Yeah. It's the biggest revenue generator in Adobe today, mm-hmm. that platform. Um, it got Adobe to put a headquarters here. Yeah. I mean, we owe Pastana and Josh James a lot. I love the those tech guys. Community. Have great respect and admiration for yeah. both of those those gentlemen. And they and weren't going to fail. No. <laughs> there was they, no way. I mean, you, and you had the perfect complementary partnership between the two. And you see now in their next chapters, you know, Josh leading Domo yeah. and John Pistana leading Omni or not Omni, Observe, Observe Point. Point. Yeah. And just Observe Point's trajectory and Domo's as two major contributors to the Silicon Slopes landscape. Oh, yeah. Um, and who knows how many other countless enterprises and ventures that both of them have provided angel Yep, funding too. I mean, They've invested that in, goes that yeah. goes untold. That story. I mean, I could only guess the dozens. Oh, I think probably it's much more. more. Yeah. It could be fifty to a hundred yeah, different enterprises crazy. that uh, that those gentlemen are investing in, that they are supporting. You know, great, great entrepreneurs don't typically rest on their laurels. After yeah, it's a, interesting. A, like, they don't video. stop. Like I remember, you know, uh, I was talking to Josh about this because obviously, you know. Josh is part of Silicon Slopes, and he owned it um, inside of Omniture. Interestingly enough, I don't know that people know this, uh, Adobe bought Silicon Slopes when they bought Omniture. Wow. And Josh had to get it out. They didn't know what they were, just because Omniture owned it. Yeah. And so when Adobe bought Omniture, they bought Silicon Slopes, and Josh got it out, and then he put it inside of Domo, and then finally we created the nonprofit, so it would be like its own thing in 2015. Yeah. But Silicon Slopes is Josh's from like 20, 2002 to 2015 that's like a 13 year run where he's just funding it himself yeah it's pretty crazy it's visionary yeah i mean one person to be funding it out of his own pocket because he loves this community 
No and reason to do that. Yeah. You look at you look at Todd Peterson, uh, yeah. in another incredible entrepreneur that has been not only I think one of our greatest philanthropists in the history of Utah. Oh, for sure, yeah. But is also investing in so many different companies. Uh, Ryan Smith. Ryan's I mean, investing Ryan, a lot. Yeah. You know, his, Ryan's got a lot of money to invest, and he is dynamic. He's visionary. He yeah. is. He's preaching the Utah story yeah. to the rest of the world, and he's creating momentum on a level that I don't think we've ever seen in Utah. And I don't think we've ever had anyone actively promote this state as consistently as Ryan is doing no. right now. No. And in such an impactful, visible way, right? Like, he's the owner of the Utah Jazz. That means something. Yeah to the rest of the world, right? Yeah. Like I kind of think of like um, the Utah Jazz as like the front door to Utah, oh. right? It's how you get, it's how you know who we are. Like yeah. you go somewhere and like, hey, remember when you had Andrew, Andrew uh, Karolinko in like the 2004, 2005, well, what? And they don't know anything about Utah. Yeah. Other or than like we Stockton had Karolinko or Malone. Stockton Malone. Remember the like, playoffs, <laughs> and the, you know, they're facing off with Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen. I mean, I'm not even a sports guy and I remember being on the edge yeah. of my seat. I'm pretty sure that's the highest rated NBA finals of all yeah. time is that nineteen ninety eight. Incredible. And and Ryan's reach, his influence now with with the success of Qualtrics and funding so many other enterprises within, you know, not only Smith Entertainment Group, but everything he's doing in the community to champion Utah, uh, it's it's next level and it's capturing the world's attention. Interestingly, my wife and I were just in Venice. Uh, we I took my wife for her fiftieth birthday. Oh, that's great! To Italy, yeah. Um, to Venice. We'd nev never been. Neither of us had been to Venice before. And it was beautiful, and I I couldn't believe it. It was. Uh, did you did it make you want to live there? Uh, to some degree, yes. Yeah. I mean, the nothing shuts down at night. I mean, <laughs> you can walk right down the street, and at eleven o'clock, people are just getting dinner. You can go get a sorbet. There's nightlife. There's energy. Safe. Uh, it felt safe. We walked everywhere. I mean, yeah. there are waterways. It was funny. We went to this glass making factory. You know, Venice is well known, or you know, that area, that region is well known for its its glass making. And mm -hmm. they they took us to this this Murano glass uh, multi generationally owned facility. And as we walked off the boat and were welcomed, um, they they apparently they they'd done their homework and they knew we were from Utah. And they welcomed my wife and I, and they said, oh, we were just entertaining your president. We just had your president here, and he just, the president of Utah, just <laughs> purchased, you know, a number of items, and we were so excited. And I said, I looked at them, and I said, well, you mean Governor Cox? Was Governor Cox and, and Abby here? And they, yeah. they looked at us. They were a little puzzled. They said, mm. And a few minutes later, they came back with their iPhones, and they said, no, this is the, the president of Utah. And they and it was Ryan Smith. <laughs> and Oh, I and, love that. He's going to love like, that. Oh, and they said the president of Utah <laughs> flew in on his private jet and, you know, left. He and, is the um, president of Utah. And it was so awesome because his impact as an ambassador for Utah and and the fact that people across the ocean wow. were were talking about Utah and and it was in nothing but the most positive glowing terms. Um it was a proud moment. That's we, so cool. We uh, we were just grinning ear to ear, and it was uh, it was really fun to see that reach. Yeah. And, you know, I see similar reach, and it's an unlikely twist to my story with Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah. You know, this most unique real estate acquisition, if you want to call it that. You know, I acquired this this 512 acre piece of property out in northeastern Utah from like a, a pretty eccentric billionaire, didn't you? Or yeah. Like so seven and a half years ago. I secretly acquire this property with no intention of ever allowing my identity as the owner mm -hmm. to be in the public domain. Um, bought it from an elusive billionaire out of Las Vegas, Robert Bigelow, a Bigelow Aerospace, who'd made his fortune in real estate, developing the budget suites of America extended hotel chain, and then really uh, moving into private space with- Elon. Yeah, and yeah. he acquired NASA's Space Habitats program, has worked with Elon Musk and NASA and so many others, and he is positioned to be the real estate developer of space. That's cool. <laughs> and um, and you know, I, it's an unlikely um, twist in my trajectory where where I was 
you know, given the opportunity to meet this very interesting, successful individual yeah. that I shared some common DNA with, with, with respect to real estate, background sure. in real estate. I mean, I, I'm a curious thinker. I, I, I'd never seen a UFO or a ghost or an orb or anything of the sort, and I had grown very skeptical sure. of those things, anything in the paranormal realm, especially by that time because of, of a number of experiences. Um, but it, it was an intriguing prospect to buy a piece of property that had been part of a Pentagon-funded black budget program, according to Mr. Bigelow and his advisors, and which by the way, came out to be true in 2016, a year after I acquired the property, the New York Times broke the story on the fact that, uh, and Politico did a huge profile on the fact that Skinwalker Ranch had been the center of the Pentagon's research and investigation into the UFO phenomena and a lot of other uh, high strangeness, as, as, as we call so it. So did they own it at one time? No. It was Mr. Bigelow actually formed a partnership and, and used the ranch was, was a platform, oh, was a center of gravity for, for not only testing various theories but monitoring the airspace and, and being able to potentially um, document and prove the reality of, of these things that may have national security implications. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you, you look at the fact that our airspace has been violated by craft of own unknown origin using what appear to be advanced physics and propulsion systems that, that defy our current understanding. And to have a, a, a living laboratory where for whatever reason there is a high frequency of sightings and yeah, activity. That's the most fascinating thing. Uh, why? Why Skinwalker Ranch? I don't know. I mean, it, it it is centered right in the heart of the Uinta Basin. There is this natural bull okay. out there. I mean, the the Uinta Basin is is really you know called such because of the topography, the unique topography. And and I it may it may be a coincidence, may not be a coincidence that it's dead center. Um, but there's something very unique about this place, and for whatever reason. Uh, it seems to to be the center of gravity for for the highest frequency of UFO sightings, even bizarre cattle mutilations that have occurred over decades oh to you know unexplained electromagnetic phenomena and anomalies that baffle scientists and some of the leading experts. And so it's I bought it as as really a skeptic. And Did I, you go to it before you bought it? No, uh, days. I, I okay. actually visited, I think, five five days. I flew into my helicopter with an advisor, someone who I worked with since I was 18 years old. He was my first big developer client who's kind of in semi-retired mode and had very close relationship with the Indian tribes, with the Native American oh, community. Okay, yeah. And I felt like he his background, his expertise, and the fact that this property is sequestered right in the middle of Native American tribal lands and is bordered on three sides by tribal property, I felt like it was important to have his perspective, his guidance, and to, to enlist him, even mm-hmm. though he thought I was crazy when he heard you know what I was acquiring. He thought it was, it seemed to be, uh, as my father also said, a boondoggle, a, uh, <laughs> you know, a, 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 a probably a waste of time. And so... Uh, we flew in. I was shocked at how beautiful, it's a stunning backdrop. I mean, you have this mesa plateau that runs the entire expanse of the property, this red rock mesa that has cave systems in it and um, is a is a landmark that, that runs east-west on the property. And then you have waterways that bisect the property. And then you have these clusters, these three old homesteads that are over 100 years old that are scattered across the property that... Uh, for whatever reason, also seem to draw activity and have a, a very unique history. And so as I flew in, I thought, wow, this this is stunning. I've never seen such a stunning, more diverse landscape mm. in my life. And it's surrounded by thousands of acres of tribal property and is centered right in the heart of the Uinta Basin. I felt like, well, you know, it, this, is, this is definitely a unique property just for the, the natural beauty 
and at the time I felt that there was likely you know, 95% or greater chance, that in spite of the reports and the claims, that there was a natural prosaic explanation behind mm-hmm. all of the strange events that had occurred. Um, I felt, and I told Mr. Bigelow this, I felt that what had been reported for decades was probably nothing more than an adult scientific snipe hunt. If you're familiar with what a snipe oh, hunt yeah. is, oh, yeah. it's a, a scout. I'm an eagle scout. I'm an eagle scout. Too. And, you know, the, the mind, the human mind is a powerful thing. We can psych each other out. I mean, it, it, I felt it also could be the product of groupthink. You get enough like-minded people together, just like a snipe hunt mm-hmm. uh, exercise, and and people start seeing or thinking that they're seeing or hearing or experiencing things that may not necessarily be real yeah. or grounded in reality. Um, and so, and at the time, I also was serving on the National Parks Council, the Boy Scouts of America board. I mean. You know Stan Lockhart. Oh yeah, loves yeah, yeah. Stan to death. Stan is one of the the greatest individuals yeah. in our community, and uh, I was serving with him on that board. And I thought, gosh, wouldn't this be an incredible opportunity to offer this property up and donate it to the Boy Scouts for a scouting, yeah, um, a scouting retreat? As as an Eagle Scout myself, yeah. I felt that that would be an incredible opportunity, and. Um, and if with there being, from my standpoint, I didn't think there was really probably any danger or anything really mysterious about the property other than the folklore. Yeah. You know, that's how I set out to, to, to kind of prove that there probably wasn't anything going on and to transition the property into some, some yeah. other use uh, or intention. And, and, of course, I was wrong. I ended up being proved wrong and humbled, brought to my knees with the and by the reality that there is more yeah. going on there than meets the eye. And I I I'm still baffled. Even now that we've had several seasons of our hit series, The Secret of Skinwalker yeah. Ranch, that have brought the discoveries and the events and activity there to the global public. Um and we have a spinoff series, Beyond Skinwalker Ranch, that is a hit as well, that aired this last year. We're right now um, moving into season two, and we'll bring forward, I think, 16 episodes of that to match up with what will be season five of our most recent uh, documented research which, and Which is going to be pretty crazy, right? It's going to blow people's minds. Yeah. So season four, I thought, there's no way that we're going to be able to see phenomena like this caught on camera. I mean, it was so stunning. I think we, we captured what could arguably be the best evidence of what we call transmedium, unidentified aerial phenomena. We saw this, this, this object that came down from the sky and descended in the middle of an experiment where we are launching rockets off. I'm up in the helicopter. There's a GoPro camera fixed to the, the bottom of my helicopter capturing from different angles the area activity, and right when the spectrum analyzer was was you know showing all sorts of erratic uh, signal activity and behavior, which we were like, why would this be happening up in the air, mm-hmm. out in the middle of nowhere? All of a sudden, we see this caught on GoPro camera right below the helicopter. We see this bright object descend from the sky, and go into the what we call the east field, which is this area where we have this megalithic site. There are these large stone uh, structures placed in a circle, and we have some petroglyphs in that area as well that have been very interesting. But we saw it, it, it literally drops down into that east field, and then seconds later exits the base of the mesa, comes out of the base of the mesa below the helicopter, and it all... I've watched the raw footage over a hundred times <laughs> and I've had a, a retired four star general who is the former head of us space command also look at it with me. And I've asked what, what explanation do you have for this? Have you ever seen anything like this documented? And the, the answer has been no. I mean, it, it has baffled everyone. And the thing that is, that is, quite curious is that it's the correlations. It's the fact that the spectrum analyzer was, was showing strange activity, Mm -hmm. unusual readings. And there were a lot of other things happening within that space of time that, uh, 
that that were contributing or at least potentially part of what was happening. I mean, oftentimes we have to to remind ourselves that correlation is not causation. Yeah. But if you have enough correlations that occur and you have enough data born out of repeated experiments, yeah. Uh it it really uh it bears I think serious consideration. So it's been interesting and I could go off for hours on Well, what was the moment that brought you to your knees? Uh, seeing a UFO, a flying saucer in broad daylight on the ranch, uh, in the middle of the day. And it's kind of a long story, but you know, I was, I'd owned the property for six months. So from April, 2016 to October, I'd owned the property. I'd been going out there every month and, and meeting with the caretakers. I had a drone surveyor, uh, that was capturing vi- video of the, the property and taking, footage and also providing security. Jim Morse was acting as ranch manager. Mm. I had a superintendent, Thomas Winterton, that was overseeing infrastructure improvements because it was a dilapidated mess when I acquired it. There was really, you know, the, the septic system wasn't functioning properly. You know, we just, there were a lot of things that, that needed attention and as well as documenting what was happening on the ranch or at least building a documentary record. And for six months, even though certain things showed up on camera that were brought to me, I had yet to see anything or experience anything myself that was unusual. Every time I flew out there or drove out there, it was nothing but a peaceful, serene landscape. Yeah. And I couldn't figure I said, there doesn't seem to be anything unusual. And we are close to Hill Air Force Base and the Utah Test and Training Range in the largest inland test and training range in the United States, perhaps the world, yeah. uh, right here in our backyard. And I thought, yeah, they, who knows what could be tested in our skies that has a conventional explanation to it. And, and it wasn't until October 14, 2016, when we were hosting a dignitary, a surgeon, prominent surgeon out of Las Vegas, who was the attending physician to Area 51, whose number oh, one wow. item on his bucket list was to see Skinwalker Ranch. <laughs> when he flew out for the day, and I hosted him and some uh, some gentlemen that accompanied him as security, uh, everything went crazy. Uh, I had my physicist there, Eric Bard, who documented, you know, smartphone, his iPhone was malfunctioning, was flashing purple um, on on several different occasions. Um, and, you know, people were feeling, getting all sorts of sensations. We had rapid battery depletion uh, with our smartphones. In fact, my smartphone, my iPhone went from like 80% to zero in, the, in a matter of minutes. And, and right at the height of everything going on, I mean, one, one individual... Uh, was rendered catatonic for a period of about 10 minutes. Wow. Um, so as we stopped behind Homestead 3, we're waiting for our phones to be charged back at the uh, the command center of the trailer, uh, the security trailer. Uh, members of the party noticed that uh, one of the security personnel that came out for the day, big six-foot-six six guy, was, was missing, wasn't with our party. And so I went to look looked for him and walked around the backside. And at that moment, not only did I, I have a sensation where it was like my ears were boxed and I, it was like entering a soundproof room. All the ambient noise instantaneously disappeared and it was very odd. But I saw this huge, this huge guy standing upright in the back of the Polaris Ranger UTV that we'd driven out there. And I thought, that's strange. What's he, what's he doing back there? And as I, as I walked quickly toward him and would yelled his name and it was it was like yelling underwater that it was a strange sensation you know what it's like when yeah. you, you oh, yeah. st- try to scream underwater it was much like that until i got right up to it and saw that his eyes were closed and i yelled his name again and then all of a sudden the all of the sound returned the sensation was gone his eyes fluttered open and i said what's going on and he says well that that was weird and i said what are you talking about he said, well, when you stopped the vehicle and all poured out, when you all got out, I stood up and suddenly I couldn't move. He says, I, I couldn't move my head, I couldn't speak, and everything went black. And I said, 
I looked at him and I said, wow. I, and he, he asked, well, how long, how long have I been here? And I said, probably about 10 minutes. Oh my and, gosh. and I asked him, have you ever experienced anything like this in your life before? And he, he just shook his head. And it's funny after that day, he ended up in the hospital for three weeks really? with a mysterious illness that rendered him completely bedridden. They didn't, they couldn't really diagnose what was wrong with him. It was like an extreme flu. He was completely <laughs> immobilized in a different way. Instead of being immobilized where he's sitting there standing upright catatonic, he, he ended up very sick for weeks immediately following his visit. He was feeling very uneasy. And as, as, as we proceeded to pull the group together to go back to base camp or back to the, the security trailer, uh, we're traveling in this UTV on mm-hmm. the base, on the, this dirt road that runs at the base of this, this Mesa plateau that runs the expanse of the property. And all of a sudden, in the back seat, I hear this guy, the other security professional, start yelling, stop the vehicle, stop the vehicle. He's, I look back, and he's, he's waving his hands up in the air. I'm like, what, what is he talking about? So I bring it to a stop, and it, you know, dust everywhere, and, and I look back, and he says, look, look, look. he's, he's look, pointing right up ahead, and, and I look right where he's pointing, and sure enough, right ahead of us, right above, about 100 feet above the mesa, in broad daylight, clear as day, is this silver grayish disc, about 40, 50 foot long. It's just sitting there. And we're all stunned. We're, we're looking at it and saying, are you seeing this? Yeah. And a few seconds later, it literally changed positions. It darted to the left, and it was in the blink of an eye. You didn't even see a blur. It was literally, it changed positions instantaneously, almost like a video game. Yeah. We were all sh- stunned. Uh, <laughs> all said, whoa, how did it do that? And then a few seconds later, it dropped down. You could... A few seconds later, it darted to the right, and it's just barely above the Mesa Plateau right in front of us, and then it was gone. The whole event lasted all of about 20 seconds, but it was life-changing. I went in, in that moment from being an open-minded skeptic to not a believer, but an experiencer. Yeah. And I could not deny the reality of what we had witnessed, and it having multiple witnesses, people that I had no association with or contact with before that day or after Mm -hmm. since, all see the same thing. And when sequestered after the event by my principal investigator, they all had the exact same documented account. We all saw the same thing and attested to that. And in the fact that it followed Smartphone malfunction, electromagnetic anomalies, acute medical episodes, yeah, and then a a sighting of of something that just appeared to defy any conventional explanation. It was a game changer, and from that point on, I I focused a lot of resources and efforts on instrumenting the property, pulling together the infrastructure and the improvements. I have a a lot. Uh, a lot of people to thank. My my superintendent Thomas Winterton has been incredible. He's he's a MacGyver for real. Yeah. He can put together anything, and he's you know he has a general contracting background. He's an entrepreneur, but he really has helped us build the facilities. A, a NASA mission control equivalent out there at the ranch <laughs> that is state of the art. That now has fifty surveillance cameras, infrasonic sensors, thermographic imaging. Uh, you know, you have a FLIR camera system set up, um, everything you can imagine, avionics, uh, receivers that are tracking all of the air traffic, the commercial and private air traffic yeah. coming in and out. I mean, everything you would want in a multi-sensory type of platform to study the environment and the rest is history. Um, and, and on the show. Yeah. And literally uh, it was crazy. After that experience, a year later, we were essentially summoned to D.C. to give testimony uh, to, to some committees relative to the, the investigation under my stewardship. I consider myself a steward, not the owner of the property. Yeah. Um, and, and then uh, 
Within months, the History Channel came knocking, and producers, the top production team for the History Channel, every week were calling to try to get an audience. They wanted to know who the owner was and if they could have the opportunity to pitch that owner on a docu-series effort. I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I told my people, just tell them no. I, I have no interest in bringing television cameras into inside the fence. I do not want to open our scientific investigation up to that kind of circus. Yeah. And I don't want my identity yeah. revealed. I I have a lot going on. At the time, I was I was very busy. Um, I just merged Coldwell Banker Commercial, which I built, you know, Coldwell Banker Commercial Advisors to thirty offices in eleven states with over seven hundred professionals, and and we we are just going through a merger and merging all of the Intermountain offices with Colliers International, mm-hmm. where I'm chairman and, yeah. and co-owner, and I. In in representing so many important institutions, companies, entrepreneurs, investors, I just did not want. Particularly that time, everything was blowing up. The yeah. real estate market was blowing up here in the state of Utah, yeah. for sure. And I, I I didn't want that to distract from, from I didn't want the, the secret project at Skinwalker Ranch, as real as it is, to be a distraction. Um, or in any way potentially undermine my, my, yeah, my reputation yeah, sure. and, and everything I'd built over 30 years. And, uh, and, but they ended up persuading me. I, after about a year, I finally acquiesced. I said, okay, fly in. I'll hear your pitch, sign the confidentiality agreement. I'll, you know, we'll, we'll have lunch in my turf yeah. here in Salt Lake City and they put together quite a persuasive pitch. They said, well, why would you not have the leading documentary film professionals in the world on your property recording the reality of your investigation? If what you are seeing and documenting is real, why would you not want that documented by yeah. the leading professionals and brought to the public? The public should know. I mean, this would be an incredible platform and and vehicle to be able to disclose to the public the reality of For what sure. you've seen, Brandon, with your own eyes, that you know that you've documented, you have data now supporting. And I I couldn't disagree. I said, you, you're, you're very convincing and you make a good point. And so I, I said, I'll, I'll, I will consider proceeding forward on a couple of conditions. Number one, you can't fake anything Nothing can be faked, contrived, or manipulated. It has to be absolute truth. Um, I don't want to end up being in this ghost hunters category with people with night vision goggles right. tripping over themselves in the dark. Um, I want this to, to absolutely be grounded in science, and and I want it to be a, a true, accurate record of our investigation that I've been leading for years. You know, we have all the instrumentation that has mm-hmm. been in place for several years. We put all of this in place before any any yeah. television docu-series. They've en- ended up inheriting the benefit of having all of this in mm-hmm. place. Um, but, you know, I told them, it, and I, I did not want to have a Hollywood casting call. I said, you're going to have to, you're going to have to just involve my team. Yeah. None of which has been on television or <laughs> really cares to be on TV, including me. I, I don't, yeah. in fact... I my other condition was to keep my identity confidential. Mask my identity. Yeah. You need to disguise my voice for commentary, whatever. They went ahead and said, "Well, we'll we'll grant you your requests other than your identity. Uh, if you want people to truly believe and to to see the the genuine nature of what yeah. you are presenting, there." It's going to require you standing behind. And they said, well, you speak of integrity, of truth. Why would you not want to own your truth? This yeah. is your story. These are your people. I mean, your head of security is your old mission companion from Hawaii. You know, your ranch manager was your first client when you were 18, who, you know, Jim Morse. Um, your scientist you've been with for over a decade, you know, working on other very conventional projects with in some cases. And they had a point and essentially, you know, did everything they could to Jedi mind trick me into doing the deal. 
and I, <laughs> and the rest is history. It, it has been an interesting process for yeah. me and for my team. Um, they did bring in, they had proposed that uh, an outside credentialed physicist be brought in. It was not a requirement, but it was a suggestion. We flew our team to Los Angeles to meet Dr. Travis Taylor, who has multiple PhDs and I think three master's degrees. He's worked on NASA programs, programs for, for Army intelligence. Uh, the guy is yeah. credentialed. Yeah. And he's a dynamic personality. He also was a skeptic. In fact, yeah. he he said in that meeting, he says, I think you're all batshit crazy. <laughs> he looked around at the, the conference table. He said, I, I, I think you're all batshit crazy. I, I don't believe this, but, you know, I'd be willing to come on and, and help help challenge, you know, the the research and the investigation and contribute to it. And we we were lucky to, I think, in retrospect, to have his voice. Yeah. And he's been a a critical part of the docu series effort in propelling the narrative and and frankly getting very aggressive with the the more practical experiments. Yeah. You know, it shifted it shifted from being an observational science effort to more applied science and experimentation in order to, as Dr. Taylor calls it, poke the hornet's nest. Yeah. Um, so anyways, it's, it's been an, it's an interesting adventure. We just concluded filming for about four months, I think what are the most compelling experiments and research to date. And it's, it's like, waiting for Christmas. It's like Christmas Eve and waiting mm-hmm. and you know what's coming to some degree or you you have great anticipation, but it takes months to edit, to pull together all, sure. of, I mean, thousands of hours of video, audio, I mean, you have drone footage and, and everything that has to be pulled together and, um, and put into a format that, that can finally be presented to the public. Um, it's interesting because, um, it's almost like you're trying to figure out what the meaning of life is. Sure. And why we're here, where we came from, where are we going, all these kind of like uh, kind existential of existential questions. I mean, religious or existential since, questions. Since the beginning of time, people have asked in yeah. every age, are we alone in the universe? Is our reality what it seems? Are we, you know, do we. Is there are there other dimensions of reality? Is there a spirit world? Exactly. Are the, you know what uh, what is the nature yeah. of the universe and our role in all of that? And you know, and and I was raised to believe that we're part of a divinely constructed, intelligently designed reality. Right. But good luck showing with empiricism an experiment or any any evidence of that grounded in any type of scientific method yeah until now i feel like a lot of what we are delving into in in matters related to our our physical space our consciousness mm-hmm. uh speaks to those age-old questions and potentially holds some of those answers people often ask me are are you dealing with Beings from other worlds, aliens, are you, or are you dealing with multidimensional or interdimensional intelligence, maybe even time travel, travelers, yeah. or is it angels and demons? Yeah. Are you dealing with demonic or angelic activity? And you know, is, is that, that element involved? And the honest answer, based on the data that we have, that we have collected to date, is D, all the above. I think that what we're witnessing is a diversity of phenomena. I think there are many different origins and agendas associated with the phenomenon and what we are seeing at Skinwalker Ranch. Now, understanding the nature of it, uh, that's what we're, we're trying to Well, trying it's interesting because I don't think you have to prove or anyone has to prove anymore that UFOs exist. I think oh. that's clear. It's it's real. I mean, Done when you deal, have that's when you bad. have decorated fighter pilots going yeah. before Congress, you have people people that are highly ranked that are finally at great personal risk in yeah. their careers going on record even this past year with the reality of what they've seen, what they've documented, radar technicians have documented and, you know, 
And no matter what kind of cover up or disinformation campaign has been rampant. Well, we've had presidents even say it. Like sure. Obama said it. Clinton said it. There's. I read something once where Jimmy Carter um, was like, I want to know about these UFOs. Like, what's going on? Mm-hmm. And they're like, yeah, all right. And then it finally he's like, no, I'm going to go. I don't know where he went, but I'm going to go to like where we're um, thinking about this and where all of this is being studied. And I want in the room and I want you to show me everything. And the story is, I don't know if this is true or not. The story is he comes out of the room and he's like, he just starts crying. He puts his head in his hands and starts crying yeah. because he just found out we're like an experiment for the, for other beings, like the whole world and all of humanity is an experiment or so, something like that. I don't well, know. We what may be living in a zoo. Yeah, we may I be. mean, truth be known. I mean, we probably are living in a zoo. Yeah. And we are. The simulation, the simulation theory is, there's a lot of accuracy to that. Well, people like Elon Musk and others have, have pointed to simulation theory as, a, as one explanation for, for reality as we know it and what, what we're experiencing. I mean, it's, I think... Have you seen Interstellar? Obviously, oh, you have. Yeah, you're many a huge... times. I love Interstellar. I love pop culture, movies, yeah, TV, you name it. Um, Interstellar is a fascinating look into what you're... I mean, yeah. obviously, like this dramatic version. Well, on different of dimensions of reality, you have dimensions. that um, that tesseract at the end. That that, and I think a lot of people don't realize that Interstellar was not only written by the Nolans, Christopher Nolan, but also Doctor Kip Thorne, who worked with um, Stephen Hawking mm. and others. Is a is a living, brilliant physicist who who has advanced theories that are, I think, pretty compelling. And Interstellar is grounded in science. I think, the, you know, Christopher Nolan really wanted the science presented yeah. in that movie, in that sweeping epic movie, to be to be grounded in, in scientific method and sound reasoning. And, you know, a good predecessor to Interstellar is Contact, Jodie Foster. Mm. Um, I don't know if I've seen that. Oh, my gosh. You've got to go see that. Okay. You've got to rent it, stream it. Jodie Foster's Contact, Matthew McConaughey, uh, Tom Skerritt, the legendary character actor, Tom Skerritt. Incredible show. It's it's so good. And before Contact, you had 2001. Yeah. Space yeah, yeah. Odyssey. And, and so it's, it's, you know, there are a number of cinematic masterpieces that – that uh, that bring a lot of these these topics to life. Obviously, it's hard to know, but like you, you're looking at this as much as anyone, and you're around like the preeminent experts in the world. It seems likely there's multiple dimensions, and we're kind of living in multiple dimensions, right? That yeah. seems like an well, anyone which who is believe, kind of mind blowing. Anyone who believes in a spirit world that our consciousness continues yeah. on and and continues to exist in a dimension alongside ours believes in multidimensional or interdimensional physics. Yeah. Um, and again, what we are documenting, what we are uh, touching on, I think is perhaps some of the best evidence that, that we are dealing with other dimensions of reality, or at least yeah. um, intelligence that has command over our, what we consider our reality and has the ability to come and go. Yeah. Um, what I liked about Interstellar was like they, they kept mentioning they throughout the movie. And then at the end, like they is us. Yeah. That's actually just us, like a far more advanced version yeah. of us. What did you think of like when you saw, I'm sure you saw the Mexico government or somebody like um, recently it was all the news that they'd found like a oh, the alien, alien body or something like that. And it looked like the aliens we'd been depicting on in movies. Yeah, like it, and- what did you think of that? You know, the jury's out. I'm trying to 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 stand back and let the process play out. I I, I think they had 11 physicians, credentialed doctors that actually sat on that panel that came forward and gave testimony that those things were real. I I think it's important that we have a global collaboration and until yeah. there's there's more global collaboration consensus uh, relative to these things. I'm I'm trying not to make any comment pro or con. 
Yeah. Um, all, all I know is what I've seen defies yeah. convention and, um, and anything is possible. Uh, without question, we're not alone in the universe. Yeah. We not, we might not be alone on earth. Oh, we're probably not alone in this room. Yeah. That's I mean, what's crazy. Post Malone, me. you talk about a podcast setting I mean, Post <laughs> Malone was on Howard Stern. I don't know this past year. And Howard Stern was saying, oh, I don't believe any of this ghosts and the paranormal. I think it's all a bunch of BS. And Post Malone was like, Hey, uh, it's real. And if you have any question, there's this place called Skinwalker Ranch. <laughs> Has he been Let there? Let me take you to Skinwalker Ranch. That's yeah. Cool. So Post Malone actually spent a day and part of a night at Skinwalker Ranch. And we, we were for- fortunate to host him and, uh, did and Stern come? No, no. I gotta get Stern. This there. is uh, it's it was it was it was great. He's such a talent. Um, it's so and, incredible. And he lives po- in Utah too. Yeah. It's so well, awesome. Post Malone is actually um, Austin is very very interested and well read when it comes to these topics. He's he wasn't just coming out to do a ghost hunters adventure. Yeah. He actually had a sincere interest in hearing the audio anomalies, which we briefed him on. And, and see a lot of the, the strange frequencies that we've documented out there as well as the, the other evidence and findings. And he, uh, he, he came away, I think, quite even with all that he had, he's experienced up until that point, I think he left with his eyes even more wide open. Uh, and he attested that in, in yeah. public. I mean, Trent Reznor, Nine Inch Nails, one of my favorite artists, someone I consider a, a friend um, and again, I, it was neat to have him come out and actually have him view and review with us the, everything from the audio anomalies and, and, and other incidents that we have documented to, to get his opinion. I mean, here's someone who's arguably, I think the most talented yeah. producer alive or one of the most talented people when it comes to soundtracks, movie scores, and his, his uh, history as Nine Inch Nails is legendary. Oh, yeah. I mean, but I mean, the, the talent, the diversity of voices and perspectives that I've tried to engage, both from science but also from other areas that are subject matter experts that bring value, I think, are helping us uh, understand the nature of what do you we're think doing. we're get, you're getting closer to like hell yeah an answer absolutely like what this absolutely all might, I mean do you think you'll get one in your lifetime in our lifetime oh my gosh I hope so I I think we already we've already um had an embarrassment of riches when it comes to the data and the documented evidence I mean to have everything we've presented to the public and it and it has mostly involved third-party credentialed experts that we brought on the property that have been witness to this with their equipment and have the data to prove the reality of what we are dealing with. That has never been accomplished before in any other setting. I mean, Skinwalker Ranch is unique in that I believe that it is the it is the most important scientific investigation of our time, yeah. especially when it comes to these topics. and And to have astronomers to have the most seasoned you know experts when it comes to lidar photogrammetry uh ground penetrating radar you know all every type of scientific analysis discipline involved and engaged and these are highly credentialed professionals and companies i mean even the largest drone operator in the united states sky elements has been out to the property multiple times with stunning stunning results or at least incidents yeah. i don't know that they would call them results and that they've had some um, some really crazy unexplainable phenomena occur that continues to baffle them but uh, what do you think like what's the working theory currently as to why they whoever they is um probably us i like the interstellar story hey. um why don't they care that what, you know, they, they have to know that this well, we're is not being recorded. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, the second anyone thinks that, that <laughs> we have any type of control over the environment, I mean, you've got another thing coming. And, and ultimately, history has shown that 
that those who don't enter with the right spirit, with the wrong attitude, end up being schooled accordingly. But it uh, is that kind of like what the feeling was like when you first saw it's like like out of this world, like almost like a spiritual experience. Like I, I don't control. I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking about this guy who went catatonic for 10 minutes. Yeah. Just ain't, like, I imagine that was like almost like an ex, a spiritual experience. I don't know how he described that. Actually. I don't know. It was surreal. Um, you know, we are dealing with forces that are completely unknown. Unexplo- you just, they're unexplainable. I mean, the, the, the GPS, the, the global satellite positioning that does not function properly above this ranch, as proved by countless experiments involving everything from fixed wing aircraft to instrumented balloons to drones to rockets to my helicopter, I mean, you name it, yeah. using so many different independent platforms and and professionals that all have continued to report the same things. I mean, this this is a, of great concern. I mean, it, whatever is causing this, whether it be a foreign adversary, if this is Russia and China, we're in trouble. If if they have the technology to manipulate at will instantaneously closed systems, closed computing systems and platforms, and even the environment to render our billions of dollars of investment in our global satellite positioning, render it useless above this property and, and to be able to, to also um, create a lot of the, the effects, the phenomena that we've contended with that has even sent people to the hospital yeah. with mysterious illnesses and injuries. If, if, the, if this is caused by foreign adversaries and they have control of technology that exceeds any of our known which, uh, which is means. possible. I don't think that's the most likely explanation. Well, though. when we're, it's it's unlikely. It it really that seems is. unlikely. It's it, it, it. But you look at the the horrifying and somewhat exciting alternative, which is it's you know we're dealing with entities with intelligence. Yeah. The, ex, the although like that would be like an explanation that would make sense. I think to the yeah, world. It's it like, makes, oh, that's China. Well, it's it's uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah it. Either way, we're screwed. Uh, it means we're not in control. I don't know if we're screwed, but I think it means that we need to be humble. We need to to really carefully analyze what we are observing in order to 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 hopefully you know, understand the nature of our environment and, and our place. And and I do think that there there are very serious issues to be considered. Um, you know, it's funny we we recently flew out. You know, Meg. From the yeah, Desert yeah, News, of course. She came out to, to actually tour the property and get an updated briefing, and uh, did a profile story in the Desert News. And as we as we approached the airspace, I had my brother, who is my pilot, full time and the CEO of Aerodynamic, our our aerospace enterprise down here at the Provo Airport. I had Cameron offer a prayer. I said he, he, I asked if we could take a moment to have him offer a prayer to ask for protection and to to set the right spirit and tone as we enter this airspace. And as I've told people going back to the very beginning of my stewardship and ownership of this property, you have to prepare yourself and enter with a spirit of reverence and humility mm. when coming on this property, whether it be coming in via the airspace or on, on ground or on foot. Because we are dealing with forces that are unknown that have the ability to manipulate our consciousness, our systems, and render us completely immobile, catatonic, or even send us to the hospital if they deem that yeah. there's a threat, whatever if whatever they <laughs> we are contending with. And that's sobering to see people end up in the hospital, end up with mysterious illnesses, injuries, and we've also contended with something called the hitchhiker effect, where phenomena ends up attaching itself to people. People have disturbing things follow them home after mm-hmm. visiting the ranch. In fact, my predecessor, Robert Bigelow, during his investigation and ownership, had you know, a number of, of military, uh, former military 
you know, professionals and, and scientists that, that had phenomena follow them home. And in some cases, terrorize their, their home environment and oh create issues for their family. I mean, dark orbs, spectral figures that would appear, all sorts of really disturbing phenomena that almost sounds like poltergeist activity that would end up appearing and causing all sorts of disturbing events uh, in their places of, of residence. And, and there are a number that don't come, they refuse to ever set foot on the property. In fact, Mr. Bigelow refuses to ever come back to the property. Interesting. And uh, the, he's not alone. There are so many that want to have nothing to do with it because they, they believe that it invites negativity, that uh, bad wow. things will continue to happen. I'm sure I, maybe this is happening and you just can't talk about it, but how is not every government and our government in particular all over this, like trying to figure this out? Well, I think they are monitoring what is happening to a degree, and I, I believe that my transparency is allowing for a true private sector effort to unfold yeah. um, before the public's eye. Uh, the fact that when we were asked to come give testimony relative to our investigation and the data, the evidence, our findings, you know, and we, I didn't even hesitate to present it. I was, yeah. I was only concerned about my identity, <laughs> uh, believe it or not, at the time. I did not want my identity to be yeah because you were, you were probably worried like hey i don't want to be known as like this lunatic who's chasing aliens and all this type of stuff sure right that's probably what you're worried about from a reputational standpoint but now like this i mean they're talking about this in congress they're talking about yeah. this what do you what do you make of that like even congress is talking about everybody's kind of like admitting that like something's yeah they're acknowledging it and and again you have professionals that are coming forward there's there's actual data i think our our effort at Skinwalker Ranch, I believe, is a key part of disclosure. Uh, you know, bringing these topics forward and and allowing the public to to become acclimated to the reality that we aren't alone. Mm -hmm. um, that that there there is a reality to unexplained phenomena uh, being part of our space, and for whatever reason, the ranch is a center of gravity and I, I i hope to get to the bottom of it the mesa may hold some of those secrets uh there's something very unusual about that mesa and whatever may be embedded buried in that mesa at one point in our investigation we extracted material that according to scientists up at the university of utah was not natural or naturally occurring and the composition of these metallic wafers most closely matched the tiles on the exterior of the space shuttle, according to Dr. Taylor and others. And so oh extracting from 400 feet within the Mesa material that appears not naturally occurring and having equipment malfunction, like constantly, every time we make an attempt, something happens or someone ends up in the hospital with a cardiac arrest oh or gosh. something... There is all sorts of uh, unusual and disturbing activity that seems to attend digging and disturbing the earth type of activities on the ranch. And uh, I think that there's, there is uh, going to be some key revelations in the next year or two relative to what we What do we got to do to get Elon out there? Because Elon's a skeptic. Yeah, I well, I think to a degree. I mean, he's part of the private space race, but he also has a handshake agreement with. I mean, he's working for the government, and yeah. you know, his biggest, I believe, his biggest customer is the United States government, NASA. Yeah, um, I have no idea what kind of agreements he may have entered into in order to gain access. Right. I. Mean, That's interesting to think about. I mean, actually. come on. Hey. Yeah, that's anyone true. who does their due diligence, who looks into these topics and really seriously does their diligence, will, will find that there's reality to it. To yeah, you can't dismiss it, and especially someone in a position like uh, like Elon Musk. I mean, he he knows he has to know yeah. that all of this is real, but for whatever reason, he's distancing himself from it, and um, 
I don't know why. I don't know whether it's a national security imperative, some type of... Um, yeah, that guy's got to keep a lot of secrets, huh? Yeah, well, anyone who has access to our to our space to yeah <laughs> to it is kind of crazy. Yeah. The private companies doing yeah, what I, mean, NASA I could used go to down do. those rabbit holes yeah, all day sure. with you, but I I I think that there are a lot of secret keepers and a lot of secrets that continue to be kept. I think most of the evidence, hard evidence that uh, that has been gathered from a Official sources or some of our most advanced systems are sequestered away into private special compartmentalized access programs that, mm. frankly, are not necessarily um, available for congressional hearings to probe into Interesting. and buried so deep. And it has been the case for a long time. I mean, President Eisenhower warned of the military industrial complex and yeah. its growing strength and and lack of accountability. Well, how how long how long ago was that? That was a different era, a different age. And look at how much. Well, one have could argue, two years later, they killed his successor. <laughs> you never. Who knows? I don't even. <laughs> I don't want to get too I'm crazy a, out there. I'm not a. I. I it I definitely wasn't Oswald. Yeah. Let's I, just say that. I. I don't know what happened there, and uh, all I all I know is that which I have responsibility <laughs> over. <laughs> I can. Yeah, I can, we don't need to solve that. I can speak intelligently to commercial real estate, <laughs> uh, some industries that I've invested in, uh, and and the ranch investigation <laughs> and some of those topics. But uh, when you get into some of those, yeah, other, some of that stuff is crazy. It's it's, uh, it's intriguing and can. It's interesting how little control we have. Yeah. Well, we don't have and much control. How how little knowledge we have. We, we actually, when you find out, like nobody really knows anything. And we don't have control. Well, don't you find it the older you get, you realize the less you know. Oh, for sure. I mean, that was one of the things that was most sobering as I entered my 40s. Realizing that a lot of the institutions, the places that I looked to to have all the answers were just as lost or still trying to to determine you know what oh, yeah what uh, what those answers are and 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 everything is subject to change um i i think we're just barely scratching the surface you look at how much we have advanced yeah as far as human civilization just the last 50 to 100 years and it wasn't so long ago that uh we were just barely coming to understand the principles of electromagnetism. Yeah. Um, I mean, it it is uh, mind-blowing to think of the hockey stick curve that we are on right now as we are speaking on this podcast. Yeah. And what change right now every second is occurring <laughs> and in all because of just collaboration and being able to leverage technology in some ways though we you know we're still in the dark ages or we're still apes I mean, you yeah. look at you look at the wars yeah you look at the stupidity of it all and the ignorance i mean people killing other people over the most dumb yeah things that uh, over just dogmatic ignorance and you would think that we'd be more enlightened i would hope that we are going to be more enlightened in the years to come, yeah. I think with information, with collaboration comes enlightenment. You look at how much the the King James Bible or the, you know, the Gutenberg Press, the King James Bible, in making that available to the masses, what had been only available to a very select few. Right. And and making that available to to everyone and to, to open the doors. Um AI Almost. might be doing some version of that now. Yeah, I believe so. But you have to be careful because a, AI is is far from perfect. I mean, for sure, <laughs> it, it hallucinates. It's yeah. it's uh, it's only trying to regurgitate through through you know its algorithms and whatever you know. Oh yeah. What it what what it from a computing perspective thinks is the answer. And sometimes I've as I've challenged chat GPT and I've asked it questions, it's funny how many times it has been inaccurate or it has spewed forth 
answers and statistics and data speaking matter-of-factly, and it sounds authoritative. Mm-hmm. And, and it's wrong. It's wrong. It, I've caught AI presenting data as absolute, you know, th- this is... This is these are the facts and getting the facts wrong. I actually haven't even heard a good explanation as to why or how AI would halluc- uh, hallucinate. It doesn't make sense. Well, it's it's just processing data and it's interpreting yeah and processing data and I I, I think it's going to be interesting to see where this all goes. I mean, a lot of movies. You, know, you take one of my favorite movies, Terminator. You know, shows the dark side of artificial intelligence and, you know, what happens when it becomes self-aware. You know, how will we be perceived? Yeah. And and then you look at, uh, you look at other interpretations and how much advancement, how much positive growth we may see as a result and enlightenment. Yeah. You know, it, it's, uh, it's mind-blowing. We'll, we'll see which which side of the fence we land on. I could talk to you forever. I need to be respectful of your time. No. though. I know you have um, other stuff. I want to ask you though, real quick, you're a huge collector of movie uh, memorabilia and things like that. Where did that come from? What's your, what are some of your favorite uh, pieces? Well, being a child of the eighties, I was raised on a steady diet of Steven Spielberg, George Lucas, Ridley Scott, James Cameron, uh, Coppola, you name it. Mm-hmm. And, and so my worldview, in large part, is through that lens, through that 1980s lens. It, it's funny, Stranger Things, you know, it, Stranger Things starts off with this group of boys, you know, that that are are kind of on this quest in this small town USA. And it's funny, in 1985, I was 12 years old, playing Dungeons and Dragons, hanging out with my buddies, and we were riding our bikes around town, and we were we were uh, questioning the world around us, yeah. and. Uh, and authority, and you know what <laughs> what it what was going on uh, in the community, and there is a very Spielberg esque quality to to growing up in the eighties that uh, that is difficult to articulate. But my passion for collecting, in large part, is is to to basically have those pieces that have informed my worldview, those those artifacts, those cultural artifacts yeah. that uh, that have have informed my faith, my view of pop culture, science, politics, you name it. And and having those things uh, brings it to life. Uh, it's the same thing with rare books, manuscripts. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you know, my most valuable, uh, single most valuable item in my collection, if I take movie props, rare books, artifacts, manuscripts, would be Oliver Cowdery's Book of Mormon with 25 pages of his notes oh, wow and you know this is the code you have that yeah this is, it's the holy grail of latter-day saint history in my view it is the book of mormon belonging to bound by even even with his own notes embedded inside is it's, it's it's the the book belonging to the principal scribe yeah. witness the only witness to all the truth claims yeah. of the faith yeah and the co-founder of the faith and he who was excommunicated <laughs> and and still never denied his account his testimony and ultimately ended up coming back before he died tragically at 43 yeah. years of age i mean that it's it's priceless and that brings that faith history to me or for me to life now, when it comes to movie props, oh my gosh, you know one of the most um, compelling movies of all time, The Shawshank Redemption. Oh yeah, I have the Bible, the the one of a kind rock hammer Bible. If you remember, when the warden at the very end goes to his safe in a panic, and he, and of course, he has to remove the cross stitch that had been made apparently by his wife that said, "His judge cometh, and that right soon." I have that cross stitch <laughs> in my office. Oh my god, one of a kind was commissioned for the movie. But then he opens the safe, and what does he find? He finds, he pulls out the Holy Bible that had been carried dutifully by Andy Dufresne, played masterfully yeah. by Tim Robbins, and he opens the cover, and inside the cover it says, 
Dear Warden, you are right. Salvation lies within Andy Dufresne. And then he turns the page to Exodus, symbolically, I believe. And right as he turns the page to Exodus is revealed this rock hammer cutout where obviously the instrument, this Bible had been the instrument of Andy Dufresne's escape. And uh, it's just such a, it's that one of a kind. That movie is powerful. It's, it's so compelling. It, it, that's an important piece. Um, I, on the flip side, on the other side of the spectrum, I have the 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 wicked, the evil clown from Poltergeist that strangled Robbie in 1982's, <laughs> you know, classic horror. It's it's arguably, I think, the most recognizable horror prop in history. <laughs> um, most recently, I acquired Indiana Jones Bullwhip from Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, signed by Harrison Ford along with, on Harrison Ford's stationery, a letter of authenticity that says, this is the bullwhip that I used in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. And the lost Shankara stone, oh, wow. along with it, that came from the prop master, as well as one of the only surviving chilled monkey brain heads. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So that's kind of cool. I mean, it's pick a movie. What's your favorite movie? Give me your top two or three movies of all time, Clint uh, Betts. I think my favorite movie of all time is There Will Be Blood. That's good. I don't have anything from that movie. I wish I had the screenplay. Yeah, that... I'll work I, on that. I think... I like the... Um, uh, beyond that, like, I don't know. I have, like... I think Shawshank's probably up there, actually. Shawshank's an incredible movie. Yeah. That's a good question. I don't know. I'd have to, like, really, like, search, like, my favorite movies. I like Hell or High Water. Have you ever seen Hell or I Were Jeff Bridges and um that's a great movie. I like I like kind of that that type of stuff. Wow. Like There Will Be Blood to me is like one of the most profound movies of all time. Like I can't even handle it. Yeah. You it, should get his hat. That hat is iconic. That, Daniel Plainview's hat. Yeah, it would be, yeah. I'll have to keep my eye out for yeah. it. My my favorite movies, I, I I'm a bit different. I, I um uh, my number one favorite movie of all time is It's a Wonderful Life. Really? Uh, Frank Capra's classic. Um, I cry every year I watch it, Christmas Day, and I <laughs> ball at the end. But you have to watch it from start to finish to get mm-hmm. the full effect. I have a letter, actually, signed by Frank Capra when the studio was essentially insolvent because of the failure of It's a Wonderful Life at the box office, where they, he and his partners of Liberty Films uh, elected to forego their salaries. Oh, wow. I've got that in my collection, in my um, in my things. Number two, Karate Kid. Oh, that's a great one. Uh, it's required viewing for everyone in my office. <laughs> that's um, a great one. I've got the referee shirt from the final <laughs> match between Johnny Lawrence of the Cobra Kai and Daniel LaRusso. Of course, where, where Johnny ended up losing because Daniel cheated. He kicked him in the nose and won by default. I think that the real history of the Karate Kid is probably more... More along the lines of, you know, you see Daniel come into town from Jersey, steal the girl. Mm-hmm. You know, he stole Johnny's girl, <laughs> and he just continued to heckle him. And, you know, and it ultimately it culminated in that, you remember the, the Halloween dance. Yeah. And what did Daniel do? Johnny Lawrence is just minding his own business in the bathroom, in the boys' <laughs> bathroom. And, yeah, he may have been rolling a joint, but he's, 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 peaceful he's he's Mm -hmm. he's in his space and what does daniel do takes a hose puts it above the 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 restroom stall and he drenches johnny just in an act of uh really provoking yeah you know a response and so what did he expect was going to happen (laughs) you know um that's a good point and so i've got a couple things from that movie number three be close encounters Oh, Spielberg's masterpiece. Yeah. Um, I have one of the surviving pieces from the set. It's the alien costume uh, worn by, I think it was a six-year-old ballerina in the final Devil's Tower scene where the, the, the spaceship comes down and the aliens come out and kind of mingle. Do you have anything from E.T.? I do. I have the original screenplay from E.T. It was called A Boy's Life by Melissa Matheson. Really? And uh, I've got that screenplay that was turned into the studio before they named it, and uh, I've got it in a leather binder. 
good question. That's crazy. Any other movies? Well, uh, try to channel it. Let's 80s. let's go directors. What about Scorsese? Do you have anything of his? Oh, I wish I don't. I you know I have some stuff from The Godfather, uh, which is Coppola, but I don't yeah. have any Scorsese. Oh yeah, God. Godfather. What do you Dang. have from The Godfather? Uh, it's screenplays. So I've got the it's oh, original wow. screenplay from uh, uh, Godfather the first, and then Godfather two, which they they really go together. I mean, it's Godfather two's the origin story. Yeah, and you've got to see the origin. You know how how did the Godfather become yeah. the Godfather? I mean, yeah. it's it's amazing. Those those films are you know unbeatable. Robert De Niro's oh portrayal gosh. portrayal is is perfect. Uh, what about Tarantino? You have anything from his? I don't. You know, t- my wife loves Tarantino. She loves Pulp Fiction. Um, Pulp Fiction blew my mind the first yeah. time I saw it because I. Like I didn't know you could do a movie. I don't know. You, I didn't know you could do credits in the middle. Like, yeah, there's like all these like crazy. So things. I don't have anything from Tarantino yet. I probably should, um, but uh, haven't followed him as closely as some of the more classic. Yeah, but yeah. interesting. I love all of these pieces. These pieces of history, yeah. our cultural history. Um, the Oliver Cowdery book is fascinating. It really is. How do you go about attaining these things? Like, what is Gosh, it? It's it's not just money. It's you've got to have the right relationships and connections at the right time. Um, I'm convinced that at least for 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 now, I've been given the stewardship, the opportunity to hold this for whatever reason for this period mm-hmm. of time, much like the ranch. Yeah. Um, uh, and it's. And it came through unlikely. It came through non-members who'd actually held it as a for generations as a family heirloom since 1850. Interesting. And they ultimately reached out to a contact, a relationship of mine, and expressed a, an interest in selling it either to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints or to someone who is who is a member that would appreciate it because no one in their family had any affiliation yeah. with the faith. And I moved. Quickly, <laughs> yeah. Had a forensic analysis done of the book. Sure. I wanted all the handwriting analyzed uh, with great care, and you know, wanted a full study of the book to verify. Because my my dad always told me, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. Yeah, most certainly is. And I thought, how how could it be? Oliver Cowdery's Book of Mormon. Yeah, I mean, and it the cover. It's red morocco leather. He stamped it O P Cowdery in gold. And um, and his notes, I mean, the, every letter matches his handwriting this to is, the detail in the bad. Book of Mormon manuscript. And the Book of Mormon manuscript, which was acquired by the church for $35 million, reportedly. I mean, we're talking Whoa. probably one of the most, probably the number one or number two acquisition in history. I mean, I, I think it, it's right up there with Bill Gates and his acquisition of the Da Vinci Codex. Oh yeah, and uh, and but I look at this book and it's it's you know, look at the the history involved the the significance of that individual. That's an incredible yeah. That's an incredible gift. Oh, you think about it. He he's the only witness yeah. to John the Baptist appearing, restoring the the Aaronic priesthood, Peter, James, and John, restoring the Melchizedek priesthood keys. He's the only witness to the dedicatory events, the the Kirtland Temple, the pulpit where Elias, Elijah, and Moses appear, and Christ himself accepts it as the house of the Lord. And and as the principal scribe for the Book of Mormon and, and one of the three witnesses that, again, went to his death, never denying that he'd seen the angel Moroni and he had handled the plates. That's I mean, wild. it's miraculous. I, I, it's, it's such an incredible story. The whole story of the restoration. I don't care what anyone believes. I don't care whether oh, they're yeah, Catholic, it Jewish, yeah. um, Buddhist. I, I really don't care. I, I think that it, people have different journeys, have sure. different faith sure. journeys, and there are different paths to enlightenment. But I, I, I think, uh, you know, the Latter-day Saint restoration history and message is, it's so badass. (laughs) Think about it. (laughs) 
if George Lucas were to form a religion, yeah, it would be Mormonism. I mean, it's it has it all, and it it presents a most compelling roadmap for where we came from, why we're here, where we're going. It's it's pretty fast. What was it's so awesome? I actually and don't. I'm not here preaching some. I'm, oh I'm yeah, not yeah, trying yeah. to preach. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, or trying to to. I don't don't mean to take a religious turn. I just think it's I think it's awesome. Anyone again, anyone who does their due diligence yeah. has to stand in amazement at just the miracle of of the entire well, movement. Just the it's, fact it's that it's compelling. the movement still exists. I mean, the fact that Joseph Smith could create something that still lasts today. Yeah, uh, it's an American made religion. It's like that in Scientology yeah. maybe is American uh, made or. But yeah, Scientology. yeah, with Scientology, it's it's L. Ron Hubbard's yeah, it's just L. Ron. Dianetics. Yeah. Here you've got an another testament of Jesus Christ with all of the claims associated with it, and and you have this movement, this pioneer movement. People literally left their homes. You yeah. know, they risked, created a state. Risked risked their lives. Yeah, it's to wild. to follow a young prophet, a. You know, his life was wild. He like wanted to run for president. He was oh doing my gosh. Like his life is fascinating. Yeah. No matter what you think of whether yeah. any of it's from the religion side is true. His life is just fascinating. What was his relationship with Oliver Cowdery like oh, towards the end? Uh, terrible. I mean, really? well, they had a huge falling out. Oliver Cow Oliver Over what though? Oliver Cowdery called Joseph a fallen prophet and they really were at odds over Based on my study, two things: Fanny Alger, the 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 um, relationship that Joseph apparently had. Um, I don't even know outside of his marriage. That. Oh, I see. And what a lot of people called spiritual wifery mm. at the time, and the failure of the Kirtland Bank or the non-bank bank, the Kirtland Safety Society, that essentially rendered everyone bankrupt, was an incredibly challenging financial crisis and failure and it was all laid at the feet of of joseph smith of the prophet joseph and so they they had this falling out where oliver called him a fallen prophet and he he ultimately gets excommunicated but he never denies his testimony he didn't say that he said he was a fallen prophet and disagreed with some of the decisions he'd made which obviously they're all men they're people are people these guys are super and, young, by the and, way. Like, doesn't Joseph die in like early thirties? Yeah. So, I mean, the martyrdom kind of cut everything short. It, it took it in a whole other trajectory. But the the funny thing is, it, again, in the wake of Oliver being excommunicated, and you have all these terrible things that the the failure of the Kirtland Bank and you know, Kirtland goes from being this prosperous center of commerce and growth to just being just in shambles. And then you have the Hans Mill massacre and Joseph thrown in Liberty Jail and imprisoned. It's largely based on the testimony of people, his closest friends and associates, his counselors, and all appeared to be lost in the midst of this period of time when Oliver had this book yeah. that he had been the principal scribe for, that he was the witness. His name is listed as one of the three witnesses. And I don't know. I can go off for for quite a while about all these things because I think it's. It, I think that the history and the well, it's just fascinating. It's on it's the like implications. Un- I mean, the implications for the entire United States of America. Yeah, it's like it's an incredible period of time, and you look at right now the the expansion of a global church. Yeah, a global faith, and it's. We're witnessing. I think we take it for granted to a degree. And again, this has nothing to do with with whether you you affiliate LDS or Catholic or of any faith. But it's yeah. it's an amazing just from just from a historical perspective yeah. to witness you know the record number of temples being yeah. built and the incredible age that we are witnessing right now. I mean, it's. It's mind-blowing stuff, and we're right here. Silicon Slopes. 
I know. is in the heart of it, <laughs> <It's> baby. <crazy. laughs> I mean, we, did you see we had Elder Bednar at Summit? Yeah, it was pretty which, cool. Which was fascinating. Yeah, that was the. I think that was one of the first times that they're. I, I I want them to come out more in venues that they don't fully control. Yeah, I think and it's great because they're going to come off looking so great. Like, why not just come out and talk and just answer questions like like i love that he didn't hide away from like the finance questions or all stuff. yeah like just just yeah you're gonna you're gonna go such a long ways i love it i love i love that our community is bringing together voices yeah. from all different faiths from different perspectives even those that are conscious even those that take a more adversarial or a negative a critical view and there's a yeah. lot of criticism Boy, there is a lot of criticism right now, yeah. and and there are a lot of people that are struggling. Sure, I have dear friends. I mean, some of my closest, dearest friends that have major questions that have that have that have chosen a different path that have have uh, lost their faith. Yeah, and that are in crisis. I mean, we have a mental health crisis of epic proportion right now. I mean, we we as a community really need to come together at this time, not yeah. pull each other apart. And we need to be empathetic toward those who may have questions, who may have challenges, who have completely different views and perspectives. It's okay to disagree. Yeah, It's okay to have a different perspective. I think there's so much common ground For that sure. we have to celebrate. And I love, one of the things I love about what you've been doing with Silicon Slopes is you've provided a platform where people from a diversity of different backgrounds, different perspectives are able to come together and share, collaborate, and elevate our community. And yeah. I'm not, I'd say this if I wasn't on your podcast. I, <laughs> if I was having lunch at Taco Amigo in Pleasant Grove right now with a friend, I'd be, I'd be saying this. It, it really is a phenomenal platform and and a movement that continues to grow and I think I think it it unifies our community it, it's helping build unity at a time when I don't know about you but I think our world is like well it's scary needing more more unity and yeah, needing do to you notice this ground. though like on like the division like you obviously you go on Twitter or on the, these other places we all hate each other that's just what it's oh my like. gosh the Twitter mob yeah they are crazy like I post <laughs> one little thing and it's either I'm loved or I'm hated and I'm equally hated if I like I post one th like if I repost something about Elon Musk yeah. like that's complimentary like ah oh, yeah. Great, great perspective <laughs> great profile this is insightful in interview with Elon Musk all of a sudden I'm completely criticized. I'm yeah. torn apart by a bunch of a pack of wolves, keyboard warriors. Yeah. That um, and th it's a tough time. And he, and I, you can't take it personally. You have to, for sure. I, and I try but, not to. But in your experience, isn't that only online? Like you travel a lot. You travel the world. You're going all over the place. Are we that divided in real life? No. And that's why this bullshit world of Zoom calls and remote working, I'm so sorry. And you yeah. may think differently, and no, that's no, okay. We yeah, can still leave, love each other and think differently. Yeah. But I, I think for the most part, with some legitimate exceptions, I think we need to have our places of work. We need our spaces and our, our community, we need community to be working together. Um, the world that we were forced into during the pandemic is is not productive. It's not healthy. You can't you can't have accountability. Yeah. You can't build meaningful relationships. You can't effectively resolve concerns. I think it's very difficult to innovate. Mm -hmm. And I don't think you can have a unique culture or cultural dynamic within your company, your enterprise, your movement without having that in person. Collaboration. Yeah. That's why I think, I mean, I, of course, everyone's like, oh, Brandon Fugel, he's so biased. He's in commercial real estate. Of course, he's going to say this. But I actually believe our places of work, the places that we commune, that we come together are more important now than ever in the history of the world. And I, I don't think that's hyperbole. I think we need to come together now. We need to bring people back into the workplace. We need to be collaborative. And we also need to be flexible. I don't think that we just abandon the the ability to offer flexibility. Yeah. 
I think one thing born out of the pandemic that is positive, there are a lot of negatives. I think it's such so many things I could just rant about right now. But one positive thing that came out of it is empathy. I think we learn to be empathetic, to be flexible, to look at our neighbors through a different mm-hmm. lens, to to be sensitive to those who may be caregivers, yeah. those who may be sick. We don't want to, please don't come in. Don't worry about your job. You don't have to come in yeah. and be here physically to contribute. But it just got out of control, and we just haven't bounced back. And Oh, we haven't bounced back. And, man, there's a generation, like, well, my kids uh, were all in school at the time, and they pulled out, and they didn't do, they didn't do school. They yeah. got, like, straight A's on, like, the, uh, you know, doing, like, the online stuff, but they weren't around friends. They weren't. Can you imagine, like, everything you just mentioned, like, around, like, loneliness and no community, all that type of stuff? And that's for adults. Yeah. What about for kids? And the way like, hey, we're just going to pull you out of school and completely away from everything. And like the mental health challenges that have come from that, I don't think we've dealt with yet. No, I and I I think it's a problem. I think the only antidote, the only cure is it's love. For one thing, it's love, tolerance, it's and it's finding common ground. And it all goes back not to again, I sound so preachy and I'm like, if you know, I'm like. (laughs) I'm just a kid from the 80s. I'm not a yeah. preachy, like, religious zealot. I'm probably the least, I think, of, of I was gonna say, yeah, in I don't my circles. I you that religious. Yeah, but, yeah. I, but I love hey, I love my faith, and I think sure. that I think spirituality is important. I think people should feel comfortable to talk about it and have different journeys in different places. But I think it all at the end of the day, it all comes down to you know, you've got the first and great commandment, which is love God or whatever the higher power as you is as you define it, and love your neighbor. Yeah. And obey the golden rule. You know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. And I feel like if we just focused on those pretty great principles. Those things, it's so funny. Those are keys to success. If you want to know, people ask all the time, what are the keys to success in business? You know, what you know, what are the 10 steps to becoming a multimillionaire or a <laughs> mogul? And I think the reality is it's a lot of it. It really comes back to just those basic principles. Just treat others the way you want to be treated. Yeah. And show and, up for them. Yeah. And be willing, if you want extraordinary results, be willing to put forth extraordinary effort. Yeah. And, and, I'm hoping that the world ahead, that people will be inspired to come together like never before. I mean, we have the tools. I mean, oh my gosh, can you imagine? We have the tools. Um, it's the, I think the open question is, do we have the leaders? Well, do we, we have the leadership? We obviously don't. <laughs> I know. If in some it, cases, in some cases we do. I will yeah. say in Utah, and I'm, I'm going to wax Utah positive here for just a second. We, I'm sorry to keep you, but no, this is awesome. John Curtis... Congressman Curtis, I love that man. Great man. I think he is a great representative. I think he is trying to lead from the middle. I think he is someone who's trying to find unity. You know what he'd be great at? In the United States Senate. Ah, he'd be fantastic. And I, I think, think we have a senator retiring. Yeah, we do. So wouldn't it be great if John Curtis stepped Gosh, in that role? You know, it's <laughs> whoever does it. We're we're very fortunate to have good people. I mean, oh my gosh. I love John. Spencer Cox is great. Yeah. And you know what? I I know you you got a lot of crap for having Mike Lee uh, from a lot of people at Silicon Slope. <laughs> well, I got a lot of crap for having every, anybody. If I, I put know. anybody on stage, I get crap. Well, you're a no-win situation. <laughs> so you're damned if you do, damned if you yeah. don't. It doesn't matter who. But I, I got to tell you, I mean, we hosted Mike Lee, Senator Lee, who is our senior senator. So you know, no matter what your politics, I mean, we're lucky to, you know, our we need to champion good representation back there. Mm-hmm. And uh we we actually hosted Senator Lee out at Skinwalker Ranch hmm. for a briefing. And the exchange that occurred was remarkable. I In fact, I felt like I was talking to one of my friends from the 80s. I felt like, oh, this guy, we could have easily been mission companions or early business partners. And you put... You put all of those, you know, a lot of the the politics and the posturing aside, and we're all just human beings. Yeah. And I came away, I 
I came away, and again, oh, I may be crucified for saying this, but I came away totally being a fan and absolutely loved the interaction and appreciated yeah. our representation there. And I can go down the whole list of all the people that have served. I mean, you know, Mitt Romney, who received a, a lot of criticism, um, I have to say some of his last interviews here most recently have been really classy. Yeah. Him, ta- him passing the baton yeah. to someone else and the way he is gracefully, I think doing so, I I mean, He's we like should the be the symbol of integrity. We should be proud. Yeah. I feel like no matter what, we don't have to agree on everything. We don't even have to agree on 50%. But I think if we we can find common ground with each other, and, and that's one thing I've really appreciated there is I think there has been a, there's been a really cool spirit in the way that, you know, he, he has, has, has really talked about the future and inspired others. I think Blake Moore, I mean, I can go down the whole, there are some yeah. really good people. We are so lucky yeah. in Utah to have such good representation. Um, I think what you learn, like in your experience with, with Mike Lee, which, I, which I've had as well, is like, we're not the caricatures we're painted as. Yeah. You know, like, it's just actually just like a human being. Yeah. yeah, with faults and opinions, and you know, like like everybody else. Well, and people change. I hey, I reserve the right to change my opinion. <laughs> yeah, I reserve yeah. the right, and I've had to change my mind about a number of things. There are certain things that I thought were hard and fast beliefs that yeah. I had, and and positions that I have reversed on. I, that after careful consideration, I have changed my mind. I've taken a, a different position. My wife, I have to thank my wife. My wife, who for decades was this Democrat, card-carrying Democrat, bleeding heart liberal. Right. And 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 I've historic I've always been a conservative. It it has been a, a really good learning experience because she's opened my eyes and helped me, I think, um, temper some of my opinions and my perspectives and and frankly change some of the positions so i i i i uh, i invite anyone to to change their their oh, their sure. mind on anything i think life is a learning process and the second that we get so stuck in our ways where we're going to die on that hill yeah where i mean so many people are just willing to just die on that hill on that whatever dogmatic position that they're taking without being open to at least hearing other perspectives. I think anyways, I don't yeah. mean to be dragging off. No, Sorry. No, ego is the home. killer of progress. Ego, yeah. ego will kill progress. Yeah. If you can just get that out of the way, you can do anything, but ego will. Yeah, kill progress. We're all guilty. I, I, um, uh, a lot of people who don't know me, they're like, Oh, he's, he must be driven by money. He's just, you know, because I'll say things about, and you know, I sure. love market domination yeah, and, um, uh, and, but it's more just, enthusiasm on my part and I've, I've never really been driven by money believe it or not I what drove me is the same thing what drives me now is the same thing that drove me when I was a teenager and that is the opportunity and privilege of working with the captains of industry yeah and hopefully having some impact on the landscape of our economy and our market and I well you've had a huge impact I love you can't it. drive i15 and not see your name like you you've had an incredible impact. Thanks for everything you've done for Utah. Thanks for coming on here and spending so much time with oh, us. Thank we gotta you. Do, I could do this all day. With yeah. You. Likewise. <laughs> no, I appreciate everything you do to lead Silicon Slopes. You have been an incredible champion. I talked about Ryan Smith and some of the others, the the incredible people. And I could, God, I get in trouble because there are probably twenty other people I need to be mentioning that yeah. have had such a significant impact. Please forgive me. Any of those that I forgot. <laughs> And you know who you are. I mean, Ryan Caldwell. I mean, there's incredible. Yeah, uh, we've had we've had an incredible group. There's so many incredible people, and I'm thankful for all of them. Um, and and I think we're just getting warmed up for sure. So thank you. you Keep championing our community, and uh, call text me anytime, preferably okay. after midnight when I'm catching my breath. <laughs> That's yeah, it is after midnight where I where I'll get a response. Thanks, brother. 